Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 40, Overcoming Fear and Building Liberty.me, with my guest, Jeffrey Tucker, founder and chief liberty officer of the social platform, Liberty.me. Before we get into the show, I'd like to share a few quick updates. We've reached over 500 likes on Facebook, and a big thanks to all of our new subscribers and listeners. You guys really make this worthwhile. There's a lot of exciting developments happening with Liberty Entrepreneurs, and I can't wait to share them with you all in the near future. Also, I'll be attending the Podcast Movement 2016 conference in Chicago next week. And if you'd like me to interview one of the hosts of other podcasts that you listen to, please send me an email at info at libertyentrepreneurs.com and I'll do everything I can to get them on the show. Okay, here's some quick background information. I became familiar with Jeffrey Tucker while he was the editorial vice president at the Mises Institute and was one of the first ANCAPs or anarcho-capitalists that I knew of. He's now the Director of Content for the Foundation for Economic Education, or fee.org, the Chief Liberty Officer at Liberty.me, Research Fellow at the Acton Institute, Policy Advisor of the Heartland Institute, Founder of the Cryptocurrency Conference, and author of five books. He's written over 150 introductions to books and thousands of articles appearing in scholarly and popular press. In this episode, we discuss a wide range of topics, including his early entrepreneurial experiences working as a child before there were laws against it, why he quit the Mises Institute and started Liberty.me, his ideas on the Ron Paul Revolution, Ayn Rand's impact on the libertarian movement, and how action is the key and often missing ingredient to creating an independent and free life. Quit your job if it sucks. Uh, move to a new town, take a job you don't know anything about, put yourself on the marketplace, whatever it is, do something to change the matrix, you know, create a disturbance. If you would like to receive all of Liberty Entrepreneur's podcasts delivered directly to your inbox, head on over to our website and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Don't worry, there's no spam, only the latest podcast each week. Keep up with us on social media by following on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and I hope you enjoy the show. I'd like to welcome on the show today the one and only Jeffrey Tucker. His new book is Bit by Bit, How P2P is Free in the World with an introduction by two people that I've previously interviewed, Patrick Byrne, the CEO of Overstock.com, and my personal friend, Roger Veer. Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. Well, it's really good to be here. I think it's an important topic. I'm obviously very passionate about the subject. Could you tell us just when you learned about entrepreneurship? When did it even come into your existence? And how has entrepreneurship shaped the person who you are? But strangely, I, I'm very fortunate to have been raised in a time where there wasn't a heavy enforcement of child labor laws. So <laughs> uh, even from the age of, I don't know, 11 or 12 or something, I was working in various positions, you know, as a, I worked with an order, organ tuning company, a piano moving company. I built fences and I dug uh, ditches and wells and did some roofing for a, a little bit, so a delivery system for a cosmetics company. And on and on. I did all of this kind of stuff long before I was even legally allowed to work, which, I mean, I think it's really tragic these days that people have to wait until they're 16, 17, 18 years old. Many don't even have any exposure to remunerative commercial work until after college. I think it's just crazy. So anyway, that was my first real exposure. And that got me interested in economics as a topic. And, and much, you know, and so when I went to college, that's what I majored in. But I was disappointed, you know, in my first couple of years of economics because, you know, the models that we were being taught uh, in those days, and I was at Texas Tech University, were also static. And they always treated the macroeconomy and economic activity in general as, you know, like a big hydraulic machine. You know, there's, there's inputs, there's outputs, it follows a certain 
circular flow and really nothing ever happens except when you get later on in the, in the book, government, you know, uh, turns out to be crucial to improving things. And government has this sort of treated as this mastermind that can, that can perfectly engineer outcomes. And it frustrated me because I loved economics, but I didn't, there was something, there was a disconnect between my experience in real economic life and what the text works, text works were presenting to me, because, you know, by this time I had already, you know, gotten you know awesome jobs. I was a manager of a men's store. You know, I, I was a waiter, wait staff at a, at a fish restaurant, and I worked for a catering company. You know, I had done all sorts of things. You know, management and, and, and maintenance and everything. I knew, and I, I, I was even. Uh, became a buyer at a men's store so and that's tricky because that's when you really have to go out and be entrepreneurial you know you have to you know it's 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 the october and you're trying to pick out spring fashions mm -hmm. you know and you have to you have to buy in certain quantities you know you you face you face 10,000 decisions and you can buy 50 of those th possible uh, things you have to buy the right thing in the right quantities uh, six or eight months ahead of the ahead of time when you're even going to be in a position to sell them and that was an unbelievable trick it really takes an extension of your time preference as we talk about in Austrian econ it, you really have to understand what it means to project out into the future to be a good entrepreneur whereas in public school for instance you know you kind of just live day to day or maybe overnight where you have to do your homework and you're just preparing for the next day but you're never preparing for say the 8th grade whenever you're in the 7th grade that's right and, and 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 in school you know there's just right and wrong answers you know and the teacher has all the right answers and it's your job to check the right boxes that is not the way entrepreneurship is. You're really leaping out into an unknown future, and you're not going to find out if you're right or wrong in your guesses until much later. And and also, you can affect outcomes through marketing. So I mean, there's there's lots of aspects to the, to this, and and it was scary. And you're accountable for for the mistakes you make. Right. Um, it was very. It was extremely interesting for me to to experience this because I did make I did make I made a lot of good decisions made some bad decisions and some decisions like my I remember my boss made that I thought were um, outrageous it turned out to be gold like if you don't mind me telling the story so one day uh, there is a you know, a, a traveling salesman who bumped through town, and it was, at the time there was a there was a pant called Duckhead, and they were cotton khakis basically, and they were kind of new on the market at the time, and he was able to snag them for from this from this uh, wholesaler for, you know, I'm just I'm guessing you know say uh, five dollars each, and he was blown away by the price. He's like, these are passable dress pants. I mean, nowadays you'd never get away with this because everybody would know that a duck. <laughs> Is not a but in those days, you know, people weren't familiar with them, so he was able to pass them off as as, uh, as uh, dress pants. So he bought something like six or eight hundred of these things, and I thought, "You are out of your mind. <laughs> We're never going to get rid of these stupid khakis with a little yellow duck on the pocket. Mm -hmm. This is insane." He goes, "You watch." So, in about two weeks, because they weren't following the usual seasonal schedule, in about two weeks, suddenly they arrived in this gigantic truck and we unloaded, you know, ghastly amounts of these pants on, like, Friday. And so we stuck them out there. And uh, I said, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with these things. He said, well, you, just you watch. And a full-page ad came out um, on Saturday morning in the local paper that said, uh, dress pants... Ducks Unlimited, 100% cotton, $18. Nice markup. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, dress pants? Right. Okay. And I, 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 uh, I arrived at work, uh, uh, I, think, I guess we opened at 10. There was a line waiting for the doors to open that stretched all the way down the hall of the entire mall. And like hundreds of people. It's amazing how the entrepreneur puts his time and his capital at risk. There's no guarantee of a reward. Whenever you're in school, say, you know exactly what you're getting into. You know what tests you have to study for and everything's much more structured. But in the marketplace or as an entrepreneur, 
it's an open world out there. You know, you have the ability to control your time and your focus and your money and risk it wherever you think your talents and strengths are. I hope that you are successful, but if you're not, then you're going to learn lessons and other entrepreneurs are going to learn, learn lessons. That's right. Chances are you're going to fail, actually, and and that's good because you learn from your failures. In fact, I think you have to you have to fail in order in order to learn. I mean, that's the only way I've really ever learned. If everything you do just turns out to be right, then you can get cocky, and then you really make a huge failure. It's far better to make a series of small failures that refine your instincts. Eventually, you win. Maybe. Isn't it interesting that if we fail in school, it's considered just this horrible thing? You're a failed kid. You're not a good student. You can't learn. But if we fail in as entrepreneurs, it almost gathers us some sort of respect as long as we pick up and learn lessons from it and our next business is that much stronger. It's, it's almost like if you haven't failed in a startup or in a business, then you haven't been working hard enough. Well, you know, that I think is a really excellent point, which is one of the reasons I wasn't afraid of, of starting Liberty.me. Well, I was afraid, but, uh, but it's why I knew that if I failed, that I would not actually fail. I would actually have some cred. Yeah, you know exactly. And, yeah. and for our for our listeners, can you just give a brief description of what Liberty.me is? Well, so yeah, Liberty.me is a, it's a it's a publishing platform and a, a social network and content delivery system, specifically for people who care about human rights and human liberties. Mm. And it cobbles together a, a community from all over around the world. And I tell you that I just I meet people every day that tell me that they've they've formed their friendship networks out of that technology and I'm just so thrilled and you know it makes such a it's such an awesome thing to to have an idea about something that should exist but doesn't exist and take all the steps necessary to make it come to exist and then it does exist and then it changes people's lives and their lives are different and history is made different all because you had an idea and you saw it through I mean that that is a cool way to live. It is such an awesome way to live. I mean, that's exactly what I'm trying to do at Liberty Entrepreneurs. I didn't feel that the mainstream liberty movement was focusing enough on entrepreneurs, or as I call them, the engineers of the marketplace. We hear a lot about the free market and market forces. The market's all that we need to focus society, and we don't need the state and their coerciveness, but we just all act independently and voluntarily, and we have these win-win situations. But I don't feel that people concentrate on the actual entrepreneur enough. It stays in this vague kind of, oh, the market can provide this. The market will provide our fresh food or the market will provide these conveniences for us. But what is the market? Well, the market is just us individual actors. And for the majority of the market is built by entrepreneurs. It's not because of there's demand, you get the supply. It's the supply creates the demand and the entrepreneurs are the ones creating that supply. Israel Kirshner calls entrepreneurship the driving force of the market. And I think that's a good way to look at it. I, I, you make a good point. If you want to think of just a market that's, that's just operating, you know, that's clearing all the time, that all products are sold, all com consumers are satisfied, you know, all information is known, all existing resources are employed at their highest utility, and so on and so on. That's not really a market, that's just a machine. Mm -hmm. um, what the entrepreneur does is he intervene, intervenes into that sort of even rotation of this conceptual machine, even if it's operating perfectly, and disturbs it and says, hey, you know what? Something sucks because it doesn't exist yet. I've got a better use for these resources. Uh, I can anticipate there's, there's actually consumer needs out there that are unmet. And I think I've got a, an, a, an economically viable way to meet them and introduces a kind of disturbance into the system, you know, Yeah. and the matrix changes. Yeah, I really like the term entrepreneur because I don't feel that it has gotten the bad reputation that, say, capitalist has. I mean, essentially, they're the same thing. But, you know, the entrepreneur is the one, like you said, going out and trying to find pains or problems in society and literally putting his time and his money at risk to solve those pains and problems. I mean, what a what a beautiful perspective that is. Well, you know, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because Israel Kirzner actually wants to conceptually distinguish the capitalist from the entrepreneur. They're not. It's it's not a conceptual. It's it's only a conceptual distinction. Uh, uh, <clears throat> in real life, uh, the same person with the idea also tends to risk risk the resources or at least bear responsibility for the resources being risked. But Kirshner likes to distinguish the entrepreneur as a, as a kind of an ideal type, like a person with an idea who sees something, who's discovered something, and has a passionate desire to reveal it. 
and the capitalist is the one who risks the physical resources to to realize the idea. Uh, in real life, we're all entrepreneurial capitalists, or capitalist entrepreneurs. But I like this distinction because it does isolate a, what Kirchner calls a function that exists within the market, which is an idealistic function. You know, somebody who falls in love with something that they can't yet see. It's an act of faith, essentially. You know, it's one thing to describe it. It's another thing to, uh, to live it. And I know for myself, with Liberty.me, I guess it was now three years ago, summer, I saw that there wasn't really, I saw a ton of liberty-oriented blogs out there and people posting tons of content on their Facebook. And I saw, you know, Facebook existing and I saw lots of internet forums, but I didn't see one place where, where we could crowdsource this sort of information and come together as a community uh, with a beautiful publishing platform that also distributed content and allowed community engagement. And, uh, you know, I just, it was, I, was, I was bugged by, by its non-existence. Mm. I mean, bugged to the point that I couldn't stop thinking about it. I mean, so that I would stay up all night spinning around in circles and drawing pictures and thinking about functionalities and thinking about possibilities and... And uh, I dragged friends with me, I'd go to lunch, that's all I would talk about. You know, I had fallen in love with something that hadn't really existed and imagined that I could play a role in causing it to come to existence. I felt, I felt uneasy about the present state of the world because this idea was not realized. And it was a level of uneasiness that became actually obsessive uh, to the point that nobody, right. nobody even wanted to be around me because this is, I could, I would only talk about this. Yes. Like, could you just start building this so we can talk about something else? <laughs> yeah. And, or, you know, change the subject or something. I mean, people just got sick of me, but it, it was a fascinating period of my life because I've never quite experienced anything like that. Like a, like it was maybe, maybe it lasted, uh, you know, two months, two and a half months, something like this. And uh, it was just, I, like, I knew it could happen. I saw it. I imagined the way the world would exist you know, how things that would have changed things for me and for everybody else. And it was so real in my mind and it bothered me to look outside the window and not see that thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was that level of, of upsetness that you feel. This is, way, this is the way entrepreneurs feel. I mean, they just have this kind of burning passion. They just, they just have a, a sense of certainty. Of course, it's good to be surrounded by, by people to check your dreams. You know, you need accountants and, you know, you need other people with uh, experience in the industry you're entering into to kind of, to kind of uh, sow some doubts in your head. You need that because you need to check, you need to check yourself, you know. But, and, and I certainly, I certainly did that. But what happened by, I guess, August or September, as I had by now cobbled together uh, a really beautiful business plan. And I had bought a domain and it was, it was, it was all there, everything except for the money. And then I had to start, because I didn't have the money to do it, I had to, I had, and I had to pay talent to, uh, to, to do all the, technical, the, the deep technical work. And I had to have resources to pay them, so I had to start raising money. And that was tricky, because like, where are you going to go for that? Right. You know, so I, I hit up, I made a bunch of copies of, of my business plan and hit up you know, 20 or 30 different uh, people I thought would be interested in uh, investing in it. And I established it not as a nonprofit, but as a for-profit in the sense that I wanted to face regular accounting discipline there. And I got, you know, I got 20, 20, 30 rejections. Wow. And, but the thing is that it didn't, it didn't discourage me because I knew it was a great idea and I just blamed myself for failing to explain it well enough. That's why I looked at it. It's right. Like, yeah. You knew so, the value that it had. It was yeah. your responsibility to convey that value. Yeah. And I just had to figure out a way to do it. Yep. And then I was at some event and uh, I bumped into a couple of people I'd met at some, some other time and we were just sort of talking and I realized that they might be people of some means with some business experience and I just reached into my, to my bag and I pulled out my last two mm -hmm. <laughs> business plans and I had them in both of them and I said, you're going to think this is crazy, but here's something I've been working on. And they looked at it, saw the title, and said, "Uh huh, venture." And I said, "Yeah." <laughs> and they said, "Well," I said, "Do you want to read through it?" And they said, "No, just tell us about it." And they put a, put aside the plans. And I told them about it, and then um, I was flown to an undisclosed location uh, about a month later. Um, the deal was made, and I got funding. Wow! Yeah, ne networking is just so important. So, I mean, I've 
I donated Bitcoin back in maybe 2013 or 14 to Liberty.me because yeah. I, I saw it as a platform of helping liberty minded people network. Yeah, we can network on Facebook, for instance, or we can network on Reddit or stuff like that. But to have a platform solely dedicated to liberty oriented individuals is, is something yeah. that the world definitely needs. Yeah, and then the burn rate, uh, which is, I guess, the term that's used for uh, the pace at which you're you're running through money becomes very important in private enterprise. And this is why most businesses fail that I have a long enough uh, period in which they can absorb losses. But it was much faster than I expected. So by January, I was running out of money and I hadn't released yet. So that's why I did the crowdfund. Mm -hmm. And uh, I raised about 250K with one crowdfund wow, campaign. Congrats. That was where I jumped in the, in the cold lake, you know, off the diving board and all that kind of stuff. I remember that. That was a funny experience because I, I knew I needed to go crowdfund. And, and what I thought I would do is turn on a camera, sit in a chair with a, with a suit on and explain to everybody why this is necessary. And I thought, you know, that seems a little lazy. I want to demonstrate that I'm willing to do anything to make this happen. So I just kind of got in my car and I just drove around and I bumped into this playground, you know, and uh, with, with a lake attached. And I thought, I wonder what I could do here. And I began to kind of think through it. And I realized if I could demonstrate the fun uh, of a liberty-oriented life, that would be awesome. So I brought in a camera crew, you know, put on a suit. And it was funny because I thought, well, I tell you what, I could swing in the swings. I could row in those boats. I could, um, you know, sit on the monkey bar, slide down the slide. And then I looked at this lake with a diving board, and I thought, hmm, am I going to do that? And this is this was January, right? So the water was, you know, 30 degrees. Am I willing to, to jump off that diving board? Am I willing to jump off of it backwards in a, a suit? Yeah. And I thought, if I'm willing to do that, then it's, it's a signal right. to people. That you're serious. That that I'm serious. This guy's willing to do anything to make this happen. So you mentioned something that caught my attention. You said you wanted to show the fun that you can have as a libertarian or as a liberty-oriented person. Yeah. What I found in my own journey is that I started becoming an, what I call an angry libertarian. I started getting constantly pissed off about what the state was doing to us and about the banks and fiat money and the, and the Federal Reserve. And I found myself just angry at the entire system and wanting to you know, have a little cabin out in the woods where nobody bothers me and like remove myself from society. And the more I thought about it, it just didn't make sense. Like, wait, I'm the peaceful one. I'm the one that wants more liberty and more freedom in my life. Why should I feel like an outcast? Being an entrepreneur tends to turn that upside down. I mean, entrepreneurs have a ton of fun. Entrepreneurs are building and it's very alive and dynamic as opposed to, I feel like a lot of libertarians get stuck into this mindset that everything's bad. That's just a, a tough perspective for me to swallow, but the perspective of being an entrepreneur and building and networking and controlling my time and my finances and what I want to focus on, it's just so much more freeing. It's like individually freeing. Well, you really put your finger on a real tragedy. I had noticed this over the years this is a big emotive force for, for how I ended up uh, establishing a new ethos at Liberty.me. I, f I went to the uh, libertarian um, subreddits, you know, and then to the libertarian uh, group on Google Plus and so on. And it's the most depressing experience ever. Mm -hmm. You know, all you get is, is a barrage of information about police abuses and corruptions and surveillance and war and it's like it's too much yeah. I mean you know it's just it's just too much and I thought you know liberty is, is there's something wonderful we're dealing with the most wonderful topic the building block of civilization the thing that makes life beautiful surely there's a way we can talk about it in those terms and so I wanted to change the ethos of libertarianism too uh, mainly not not just because it's true but because I don't know I found myself over the over the last several years, being a kind of the psychotherapist of, of the liberty movement, in a way, you know, because because uh, people start to despair, you know, and yeah. and despair doesn't doesn't produce anything. I, I'm all for being realistic, but but being despairing is the worst thing that can happen to the human heart. It's terrible. Yeah, you just don't I mean, have the creative energy that exists whenever you're building. You know, if you're only concentrated on the the shark in the water then you know you miss out on all the beautiful coral 
And I, yeah. I feel like that's what the entrepreneur does. The entrepreneur is aware that there's a shark in the water, but it's like, how can we continue to beautify this coral and, and make create the world that we want to live in? Well, we have to do something to disturb the system or else the state's going to control everything forever. And what we've seen is how entrepreneurship, and especially in our times, because the, the tools of innovation are so widely dispersed, uh, we've seen everybody getting into the act and, and it's breaking down uh, state barriers much more effectively than, uh, than political organizing ever has. Yeah, let's use that as a segue to go in and talk about your new book, Bit by Bit, how P2P is freeing the world. And P2P, of course, means peer to peer. Can you tell us how you got the inspiration to write the book? And, and what it means to you and like how you've seen just during the last couple of years or 10 years or so, how you've seen this P2P type of decentralized technology and economy actually free in the world? Well, in 2013, my life changed because I discovered Bitcoin for the first time. And I realized this is something that I never thought could exist that, that has come into existence. And I realized uh, that something was fundamentally different about this, that the tools that were used to create Bitcoin these decentralized networks and cryptography and just you know just pure algorithmic code and and the capacity of people to, to talk to each other has invented for the first time in history a weightless spaceless uh, money that exists on a global a global basis that no state could ever take down and I, and I realized that that technology had outsmarted me you know. And if it could outsmart me, then it would certainly could outsmart the state, you know. And right. and that was an awesome experience because I realized there's lots of things out there that I hadn't really understood. So I began to look around more and more and realized that, okay, all these things, cryptography, distributed networks, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, economies and, and communications, they all originated somewhere else. You know, that Bitcoin was kind of the culminating moment, but that this technology had been invented and would not go away. And, that, and I realized that it would change the world because once people can talk to each other and share value with each other and find dignity in each other's labors without an intermediating force of, of uh, financial institutions, but not just financial institutions, the state itself, the public policy model of the 21st, 20th century comes into under grave pressure. You know, whether it's zoning laws or whatever it is these things are not viable in, a, in an age of of equipotency and universal distribution of technology and so i thought wow this is this is awesome people are finding their way to freedom through technology so the purpose of my book bit by bit was really essentially to chronicle this moment in history and and to show where it came from and its significance and i see it as really a continuation of the history that was building and becoming very beautiful in the late 19th century, but was, was stopped by World War I, the construction of the Federal Reserve, the advent of the welfare state and labor regulations and restrictions on travel with passports, the income taxes, all these segregation, uh, eugenics movement, all these things happened to really put a stop to the massive social progress we were achieving by the 1880s and 1890s. And, and so suddenly you jump forward a whole century, a whole hundred years, and you see, you know, we're picking back up on this peer-to-peer laissez-faire world and trying to take the project back up and build a viable liberty outside the state. And that's what I see happening today. Yeah, it's one thing to be able to communicate with each other through different types of messaging applications or email or stuff like that or liberty.me. But it's another thing to have our own currency that we can control that's not controlled by a central organization like a banking cartel or a state or something like that. So now we have the means of communication and we have the means of commerce without really needing to depend on a centralized body for their approval, which is something that has never been achieved before. I mean, look at the types of licensings and stuff that you need to open up a radio show. I would never have been able to fund a radio show and get all the moving parts together. I would have never been able to have a, a publication like a magazine, but you know, I can easily open up a blog and start posting my ideas and getting this, these ideas out there and this perspective out there. But we always had to rely or depend on fiat money or state controlled money. And now without that dependence, it opens up a, a whole new world that is uncontrollable by any one actor and it gives us the opportunities that we've never had before. Yeah, and money, the invention of uh, digital money was a very important building block to this because we didn't really have anything like that before. People have been trying for 30 years to create it, 
and it took just the right combinations of technologies to cause to cause Bitcoin to become valued in the marketplace and become this impenetrable, beautiful cryptocurrency in general, uh, to become a, a beautiful source of exchange. And now we're seeing, you know, the next iteration of these things and and stuff like um, uh, Open Bazaar, which right. is a kind of a, a mobile application that allows anybody in the world to open up their own retail store. It's unbelievable. Yep. And and since we have our own currency to do business with each other, we have the, a decentralized marketplace and a decentralized currency. Well, it just kind of makes sense because we live in this decentralized world. And, and a lot of people criticize these things and they'll say, well, I go to, you know, I find I find this a little bit com complex. You know, I, I don't know how to use Bitcoin. I don't know how to use the Open Bazaar marketplace and so on. But, you know, it's funny. People somehow expect all technologies to arrive on the earth all finished and, and ready to go um, with perfect implementations. That's ridiculous. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of it. You know, there are always early adopters. Uh, like, for example, internal combustion was the same way, or steel. You know, which took something like I don't know, 60 years to go from uh, commonly produced to being available in uh, the producer marketplace, or electricity, which had to be adopted by just a handful of, of people in the 1870s. You know, for for homes before it could be made more generally accessible. So everything goes through these stages. We just have to be patient. But there's reason to be optimistic about it because, like I say, technology is nothing but an idea, really. And once you've demonstrated that proof of concept, that idea becomes sticky. And it's not going anywhere. Regimes can come and go. Presidents come and go. Congresses come and go. But an idea that works becomes a permanent part of the flow of progress of civilization itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to briefly chat about a topic that I've been thinking about entrepreneurial action to help create individual freedom. For me, back in 2007, 8, 9, 10, you know, before I became an entrepreneur, I would watch Mises lectures, I mean countless, hundreds of Mises lectures, and I would read books, every liberty-oriented book I could get my hands on, and I had all this knowledge, and, and I had an idea of what freedom was, but I didn't have a way of acting on it. You know, I didn't, I didn't really have a, a platform or a means of putting that knowledge into action, which I feel that a lot of libertarians tend towards. I think Doug Casey said that libertarians have a lot of knowledge but very little money because they don't turn into entrepreneurs and start opening up businesses. In your perspective or in your journey, what has action been versus just the theoretical understanding of freedom? Well, there's a definite moment in my life and it happened something like maybe 2010, 2011, where I had been you know, hard at work for a very long time uh, working at Mises, as you pointed out. Uh, talking about the theoretical element of, of human liberty. And I was pretty convinced that, that politics wasn't the way. In fact, I was, was never really involved in, in either of the big Ron Paul campaigns. And I, I, in fact, I worried about them while they were going on in 2008, 2012, because I was afraid they were sowing a kind of baseless optimism for the possibility of pol political change. Completely agreed. And uh, and I you know I know Ronnie is a good is a good man and everything and and he thought of himself as an educator but his movement never really got the memo yeah <laughs> and, yeah and it became you know this, this sort of wild for getting him in power which was a very strange irony that a, a movement based on liberty would be rallying around a guy to to ascend to power you know mm -hmm. and do what I was never really clear what he could do really so I was I was concerned about. You know the reset, the inevitable recession that would follow that campaign, and and it did. It it, it drove people to a sense of, sense of despair and sadness, and really, I, I'm not sure how much there is to to show for it. You know, after all these years, but I I began to realize that there was a, a possibility of a different way of unifying theory and practice outside of politics. I, you know, I just thought there's there's got to be a better way here. So I think it was about 2011, I just began to take serious this, this idea that if you're really dedicated to human liberty, you would start living according to those principles as best you're able to. Absolutely. And I began to assess my own life and, and job and activities in light of that insight. And I have to say, I came up really short. I mean, I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing the thing. You know, uh, you know, I, I published a lot of ebooks. You know, I edited a lot of articles. I write a lot of introductions to books, but I'm not sure that I feel myself contributing to making the world a freer place in any sort of concrete way. 
so one of the reasons I sort of moved on professionally was because I wanted to test whether or not I could do this. I wanted to see what entrepreneurship felt like. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to engage in a sort of for profit market marketplace to not only so that I could feel freer personally and more effective, but also because I felt like a sudden a sense of burden that I just didn't want to look back on my life and say I didn't do everything I could do to make a contribution. So, you know, I started a series of, of, of entrepreneurial projects, you know, just to, just to challenge myself. The other thing that I, I felt like is true in my own life, you know, we talked earlier about entrepreneurship as being a, a disturbing force, you know, a, a disruptive force That's in right. the world. But sometimes in our own lives, we can, discover, we can find ourselves stuck in a rut in a way. You know, and and not challenged enough, at doing the same old thing over and over and over again because it's comfortable. And I felt like I was capable of more, like I was mentally, intellectually capable of doing more. But I didn't, I didn't know how to cause that to happen. Yeah, you know, just work harder at doing the same thing. Maybe there was more to learn, more, more to discover that I needed. I needed to to, to throw myself out into a into the outer beyond, you know, to just to experience that sense of flight, you know, with no bottom, with no parachute, you know, and just just so I could find a sense of meaning more than anything else. That's really what it was about for me. So that's what I did, and I took a a, a whole series of wild risks, really, and found within myself resources that I never thought were there. And I have, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I mean, it was a, it was, it was a very, very difficult thing to do. I mean, the, 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 the long hours were beyond belief. You know, the temptations, uh, you know, towards uh, not taking care of yourself, you know, when you're in the midst of a startup culture are very real. Mm-hmm. And to disrupt your life can be uh, super disorienting. Uh, on the other hand, it was extremely gratifying because I felt, for the first time in many years, a sense of, of responsibility and control over my life that I had not had before. Like, you know, there was an open terrain before me. What I did with it was really up to me. And that's a very personally empowering thing. And so, you know, I found ideas I didn't have before. I became productive on a level I'd never thought possible for me personally. My ideas about the world began to change. I began to tweak my own intellectual perspective on a number of areas from intellectual property to cryptocurrency to the place of, of power. And, um, and anyway, you know, I went through, you know, basically five years of outrageous levels of, uh, of productivity and creativity. And, and it was awesome for me personally. I can't even imagine having done anything else now as I look back at it. I mean, I'm a better person as a result, and I think the world is better off as a result. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And that's how you create freedom through being an entrepreneur, because you can't concentrate on trying to make the world free if you're not free yourself. So it's like an Ayn Randian approach that put yourself first, be selfish, create this freedom for yourself. And once yeah. you've figured out how to do it, then go out and try to help other people obtain this freedom. That is a very, very powerful thought. And I love that you mentioned Rand there, because... She was this sort of she godmothered this libertarian movement into existence, you know, in the in the nineteen fifties essentially, and um, and if you look at her works, you are exactly right. She was all of her characters were not just people of ideas only or books only. They were they were men and women of of action. That's right, and who who believe that that the freedom that you want to exist in the world has to begin with yourself. And all of her characters behave this way. All of her heroes are this way, you know. And and the essential drama of her books is is that unity of theory and practice. And she thought this way. And and that and her works continue to inspire people, you know, every day all over the world. But I I think sometimes at some point in the 1970s or something something like that, like people began to kind of forget this. They saw. It's all this is a purely intellectual project rather than a, an action project. It's interesting that that's the same decade that the Libertarian Party became into existence as well. Yeah, it is. Inter- it is interesting. I, I've thought about this a lot. I don't. I feel like I've read a lot about the history, but I don't know enough to fully deconstruct what happened. But uh, the the intellectual gymnastics and the purging and the, the codification of libertarianism into a, a system of thought and everything. It just you know, maybe all that was necessary, I don't know, but I think it came at the expense of 
the much more important project of actually trying to live a freer life, which which Rand just emphasized. I mean, she when she first began to imagine uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged, she had talked had a lot of conversations with Isabel Patterson about it, you know, and and she had had a book in her head, but she wasn't she didn't even start writing it until she had something like a plot line that that was about a plan of action, mm. like what to do. Right. It's very easy to to draw a fictional portrait of a society in decline because of an overweening state. But for her as a novelist, that was not a story. Mm-hmm. You had to have some something that people could do to take control of their own lives and turn it around. And that's what she was missing. And she turned this idea over in her head for a very long time until uh, it was a conversation, I think, with Isabel Patterson about what do you do when the world around you is falling apart. Yeah, it's wonderful how the idea of the labor union but flipped on its head where the capitalists all of a sudden are like, okay, we're going to go on strike. Instead of labor going on strike, it's the capitalists going on strike. And what's labor going to do without the capitalists or without the entrepreneurs creating those jobs? They're by de facto on strike as well. Yeah, it's just beautiful. Yeah, it really is. I would like to wrap up here because I know you're very busy. Um, Do you have any advice for maybe Ron Paul Republicans who are still in this videoing cops beating people or videoing all this stuff or complaining about, you know, the state with their boot on our throat. And do you have any advice for them to try to pull into more of an entrepreneurial creative type of perspective? Yeah. Well, turn off YouTube and look in the mirror because that's where change is going to begin. It's going to be, it's be, it begins with, with that person staring back into the mirror. There's something you can do. I can't tell you what it is. Nobody else can tell you what it is. But you, in the recesses of your mind, know somewhere what it is. Something you can do to make a difference. That doesn't mean you have to make a difference for the whole globe. It might be making a difference in your town, in your one industry. Maybe... It's just for a couple of friends, and perhaps it's just for yourself. Quit your job, if it sucks. Uh, Move to a new town. Take a job you don't know anything about. Put yourself on the marketplace. uh, Change your LinkedIn profile and see uh, see if recruiters are interested in you. Uh, Maybe you have an idea and you want to pursue it as as a business. There are countless business opportunities out there. Whatever it is, do something to change the matrix. You know, create a disturbance. And it'll, it'll cause you to become creative. And you might turn around in two or three years and say, oh, my God, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. How did I ever survive before this? How did I survive? Yeah. You know, I, I could just tell you there's so many people. I, I just give you counsel examples in my own life of people who had this happen to them inadvertently. Like they got laid off. They got fired. Their company closed. Something terrible happened. They had to go move home to be with their sick mother. Something that seems deeply regrettable happened in their life. Sometimes these terrible things are actually wonderful because they upset the status quo. And that upsetting of the status quo is what generates the creativity and the new ideas and new opportunities and and puts you into a productive relationship with the idea of human liberty. I completely connect with that. I actually gave up my engineering job of seven years and moved Mm. moved to the Caribbean to help uh, Peter Schiff open and start Europe Pacific Bank. And it was the best idea that I've ever had. I can't imagine my life now if I didn't quit my comfortable job to go down to the Caribbean to take a chance. And I really appreciate your advice, Jeffrey. You're an absolute force of liberty. You're not only one of the most intellectual libertarians that I know, you're also the best dressed libertarian. I appreciate the bow tie. (laughs) And I should say, you said that in 2013, you know, that's when you became familiar with Bitcoin. I think our mutual friend, Gabe Zukinik, purchased your bow tie for Bitcoin. And that was your first Bitcoin transaction. That's it. It was an awesome month of my life. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) He's such a great guy. Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been such a pleasure. I I really appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, I'm going to start blogging much more frequently on liberty.me because we've got to get this perspective out there and we've got to keep building freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that, my friends, was Jeffrey Tucker. Are you ready to quit your job and become an entrepreneur? Got feedback? 
let me hear it on our Facebook page. If you find these podcasts valuable, please share them. Seriously, it helps a ton. Tune in again next week for another episode of Liberty Entrepreneurs. And until then, keep building freedom.